It's the Ridgedale Hour, bringing sense and humor to an increasingly senseless and humorless world. Good evening, everybody, and welcome. Thank you, everyone, for all of the likes that you uh, preloaded on the stream. This is probably the most likes we've ever had before a stream has ever started. Um, and that just proves I that Nick's it. chat is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't give him a big head. Don't do that. <laughs> um, like I said, well, welcome. For those of you who are new, I'm Arthur Nix, and uh, Mitch Nemo is the co-host. He's the guy in the bottom. You can't see his name because it's covered by the I am out. not a bottom. <laughs> you, you know what I mean. Uh, we're joined by Nick Ricada of the Ricada Law Channel. Um, and uh, the reason we're here tonight, let me take a sip of my coffee, is to oh, uh, discuss... Whoa, whoa, whoa. I didn't know we were going to drink coffee on this stream. That is... I'm out of here. I'm out of here immediately. <laughs> yeah, you don't have to drink coffee. You can beyond. drink whatever you want. I also drink water. I drink six of these a day. Um because Ooh. otherwise, I feel I feel so sick if I don't. Um, but we're we're here to discuss uh, a book that Mitch and I wrote called "Reconstitute Us to Form a More Perfect Union," in which we proposed uh, eleven amendments to the United States Constitution, among other things. Um, Nick has read and probably memorized because he remembers everything he's read. Uh, this book, <laughs> sure. <laughs> I kid, of course. Um, but uh, he has read the book, and so we're going to discuss a few amendments um, that we're hoping he disagrees with because we don't need people to tell us what we got right. We don't learn if we don't uh, get told what we did wrong. So we're hoping for some disagreement. Um, so with that, we're actually going to get into the very first amendment, and we're going to read just the text of the amendments because um, that's really the meat. Um, and we picked the first one because we know you're going to disagree with this one on principle. Um, this is titled the Judicial Review Amendment, and it states, In all cases of judicial review, all judgments must fall within the confines of the U.S. Constitution and the Bill of Rights as written, and must consider any legislation as written when comparing said legislation to the U.S. Constitution and the Bill of Rights without inferring subtext or meaning not contained in the text as written. Um, and the reason we believe that uh, you will likely disagree in some uh, capacity or another is because we've heard you state that you don't like judicial review. So we would like your opinion. Um, just some opening thoughts, at least. <laughs> sure. Uh, so the concept of the book, right, is is this idea that we get to uh, we get this new process where we get to remake or reconstitute our form of government. Um, my my issue with judicial review has always been that it is not contained in the text of the Constitution itself anywhere. Um, mm -hmm. Judicial review is taken as a power uh, by Justice uh, Marshall, I believe, under Marbury versus Madison. And um, when they did that, they were <laughs> expressly criticizing the Congress. Uh, and the executive branch for utilizing power that was not laid out in the Constitution itself. And so what they did was they said, you guys can't do that. Only we can do that because we're going to right now. And so hmm. they created the power of judicial review. It really bothers me that this is uh, what we ended up with. To me, the Supreme Court uh, was never intended or should never have been intended. I don't know. You never know what these guys were actually thinking when they wrote down the sparse amount of words that they did. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it should never have been intended for this process of having um, a single small court that would review a limited number of cases and then those decisions would forever impact every future decision from every lower court binding them for eternity and and more importantly um impact the decisions of the supreme court going forward and restrain them to a different time i think that is an inappropriate way for the for the court to act so that is um that is my issue with judicial review when i re-envision the supreme court in a, in a way that comports with Article 3 of the Constitution, I see a court that is much bigger than nine geriatric uh, justices, right? <laughs> all, all waiting to die. 
That is not what I see as the the vision of this. I see it as just a higher appellate court, one that takes uh, one that can resolve disputes between the circuits or however you want to do it. But the highest appellate court, I do not actually see them as having the right to refuse to hear um, cases in the way that they do now because of judicial resources. I, I think the only time they should not review cases is when they just automatically agree with a, a solid legal principle in the appeals court, right? Uh, that That's fine. So they can, they can basically um, do what they did in the election case, right? Texas versus... Uh, what was it Georgia I believe was the the case where the Supreme Court basically reviewed the case but decided that it was decided correctly and so they didn't actually hear it and then they you know cited pretty much latches like everything else mm -hmm. now not that I want that particular result from that particular case but in a different system where a Supreme Court is actually just um almost like its own superior circuit that has however many judges are necessary to affect this. And you impanel uh, rotating groups of judges throughout that circuit. They could hear every single appealed case or controversy uh, that needed to come before it. Rather than just having one court sit and make binding decisions, they would make decisions based on the case itself um, and based on the actual controversy before them. So, hmm. What you, what you have then is a court that reviews things as those things come up. And so, yeah, it, would, it be, would it mean that, you know, every abortion case, for example, that wanted to go up would, would have to go there? There would be no Roe versus Wade. Well, yeah, that's, that's what I think would be the ideal. And then that would also allow the court to, um, you know, more, I guess, more appropriately react to how Congress uh, passes laws and stuff like that. I, I don't know that judicial review is the the thing that says, well, you can never do this. And because you we said you can never do this, that means that everything that you do like this will forever in eternity be locked in this weird hell uh, mm -hmm. because we're going to interpret the Constitution in a particular way at a particular time and bind you to it. That's weird to me. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I, I disagree with this one on principle because I would actually like to see the court stripped of the power of judicial review and to have the court rolled back into a different role that is actually just taking on cases and controversies and uh, and deciding based on the case and controversy under the existing law and the Constitution. I don't want them writing the Constitution into their decisions. I want them reading the Constitution and having it inform their decisions. Okay. So that something, uh, something that, me. yeah, yeah, it makes sense to me as well. Um, so something that uh, that indicates that when um, potentially um, a law gets passed by Congress and uh, a state decides to sue the the federal government, saying that the law is unconstitutional, uh, just for example, um, mm -hmm. uh, maybe a uh, um, an amendment that states they have to review those types of cases in a similar way, um, reading the law as written. Um, and reading the Constitution as written. Because the, the biggest reason we, we came up with this particular amendment is, for example, um, uh, Justice Roberts uh, reading a fine as a tax. Um, right. Or, uh, you know, not understanding what shall not be infringed means. <laughs> right. And, and if, uh, so the, the question is if we're if we're stuck with the system that we have and and frankly i have no idea how you undo 200 you know plus years of this sort of concept that we've built around the supreme court so i'm i'm speaking with the beauty of of a fictional blank slate where mm -hmm. all of that stuff goes away <laughs> cuz if you imagine the nightmare of unraveling all of that and just oh, yeah. saying, nope, all Supreme Court precedent doesn't exist now. I mean, suddenly you've got a bunch of problems. So We, we do have so an amendment take, for that. <laughs> 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 so uh, taking into consideration that this is, this is not happening in a vacuum and you're kind of stuck with this this idea then yeah that that makes a lot of sense um there there are just some principles that have been applied through the courts that do need to be undone and one of them is exactly what you bring up in uh the obamacare case john roberts 
They uh, the the word was written as a tax. It was billed as a tax. Everything about this thing was a tax. Or no, no, not a tax. Sorry, not a tax. A fine. Mm-hmm. Everything was a fine or a fee, and there were no taxes involved. And then uh, Roberts used this weird judicial principle that says if it has a possibility of being inferred in a particular way, then we must do that to basically all of this. And this is the problem with how the courts have done this. It's all for a concept called judicial efficiency, right? It's all to reduce the burden. Well, what we don't want is we don't want to say, well, you can't do that as a fine. You maybe could have done it as a tax, but you didn't. And then be right back there in a couple of years arguing over whether the tax is constitutional or not. That's the idea. But the problem is that ignores the reality that those words, the the fine or the fee language that was put in there was a negotiated agreement between the branches of government, between the Congress internally and between the Congress and the executive externally. For whatever reason, they did not want to say it was a tax. They desperately did not want to say it was a tax. They had political reasons for that. And so if they were forced to go back to the drawing board and decide whether or not they could pass it as a tax, it may have not been politically expedient to do so, and we may have not had the law in the first place. And it's it's weird because the court, when they review legislation, generally speaking, they have to take into consideration that every single word that is put in there is put in there for a purpose. Mm-hmm. And they're not allowed to read extra words in except when they are allowed to read extra words in. And so uh, to go ahead and and do that, and th- the same applies when they do judicial review. It's not just on uh, or on constitutionality. It's not just on statutes where they do that with statutory language. They do that with amendment language as well. They're not allowed to read extra words into the text of the Constitution. It's an axiom of the judicial system. And yet they read into shall not be infringed. They just add in brackets most of the time. Yeah. Right. Or some much. of the time. And and so the this this idea that they should be held to what's in the text of a bill of the Constitution, that is something that should be done. That is a portion I, I definitely agree with. It's like read it as written now either way you're going to get arguments over what the writing means i mean people are going to argue over the meaning of words but as long if we're if we can go back to just arguing over what a word means rather Mm -hmm. than arguing if a non-existent word applies i'm happy with that one at least yeah what the definition of is is (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> now you listen here you listen here we don't want to talk about that every time i do i get in trouble have to sleep in the doghouse that's I nice because i have sexual relations with that woman <laughs> look i kind of like it in the doghouse i'm a little partial to the uggos myself but that uh, is anyway. going on the uh, no context ricada twitter which by the way i run <laughs> um, real quick, uh, if you want to get the book, you can get it at books, the number two read dot com slash constitute. Um, and like we said, there are 11 amendments intended to amend the existing constitution as well as a reconstitution in the event we have to start from scratch. And it's available in ebook for four dollars or paperback for twelve, I think. Um, and the link is in the description and the Nightbot might be uh, putting it out there as well. Uh, Mitch, do you want to take this second one? Oh, wrong button. Sure. This is our uh, constitutional citation amendment, which reads, All proposed legislation shall include the full constitutional citation or citations that authorize its passage into law and must fall within the confines of the Bill of Rights as written. So can you, uh, Mitch, can you uh, explain really quick, just as an example? um, uh, Well, I think Nick already... Well, for the benefit of the audience. Well... Yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to get to that. Okay. <laughs> but Nick already already uh, pretty well explained the reasons mm-hmm. because we don't want them reading in. We don't want them inferring things that aren't there. Well, but what that but, what, what um, would that look like? Uh, for example, um, a new bill. Well, what it would look like. Um, okay, let the, the const or let, let's say there's a law that that uh, decrees that murdering a puppy is illegal. <laughs> Something simple like that. Uh, to kill a puppy is illegal would be the law. That doesn't mean that. Um, how do I explain this? 
if we're going to make that a law, you have to cite in the body of that bill, the language in the constitution, or I'm sorry, the language in the bill of rights that authorizes its passage into law. You can't just, you can't say, uh, okay, let's, let's take the bump stock van instead. Um, banning a bump stock makes no sense as a, as a law, because it's not a, it's, it's nothing. It, it's a hunk of plastic that goes around a trigger. Okay. And with the with, because it's a firearms related product, which falls under the to the under the uh, umbrella of arms, which is weapons. It's an accessory, so it's an accessory to a weapon. So it the shall not be infringed clause. I would say negates the possibility of banning it from a legal standpoint. If they if they want to ban something, they have to cite uh, that portion of the Bill of Rights that makes it legal for them to do so. Okay, so uh, Nick, and what if, are your if thoughts? If they can't, then 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 hashtag no law. <laughs> well, see, this is this is one of those trick questions. Every everything you guys are throwing here is a trick question. Of course it is. Um, idiots. <laughs> <laughs> Congress. Congress is already required to to cite to its authority uh, on the passage of bills. They have to say what what derived power they have to pass a particular law. And uh, the problem with this is actually part of the um, first first issue and going back to the Supreme Court and the giant catastrophic mess they have made by determining that, Going forward forever, their their cool interpretation of a thing applies, and that was the Commerce Clause. Uh, oh, the God. Commerce Clause is, uh, and there's a line of cases about the Commerce Clause and the Dormant Commerce Clause. It's actually why we have Obamacare. It's the authority they attempted to pass Obamacare under was the regulation of interstate commerce. And we know from the Supreme Court that the regulation of interstate commerce includes the regulation of intrastate commerce and also includes the regulation of intrastate non-commerce. Because if you can take all of the materials that you need from inside your state and all of the resources and create a product within your state entirely and never deliver it outside of the state, in fact, never sell it or transact it at all, that still is an impact on interstate commerce that Congress is allowed to regulate. And according we know this to from Congress. No, according to the Supreme Court. Oh, yes. Uh, okay. and, and we know this from one of the single worst cases uh, out there that the Supreme Court has ever decided that no one's mad about it, right? Like, it's not like Korematsu where they're like, jail the Asians, right? <laughs> that, that, that's, that's very alarming and, and offensive to our modern sensibilities. But Wickard versus Filburn is the case. And what it was, was a uh, the wheat price was crashing. It was going through the floor. And so Congress passed a law that would limit the amount of wheat any person could grow. And the idea was to stave off the supply, forcing the price to rise, and therefore uh, trying to preserve some of the institutional farmers and then some of the businesses that were surrounding that wheat. So one guy said, well, I've got all this, my however many acres of wheat you could grow. It wasn't very many. He grew his requisite acres of wheat for trade. And then he said, well, I want to grow an extra uh, set of wheat for my own personal use. And then I will take that. I'll, you know, mill some of it into flour. I'll freeze some of it. I'll use some of it as feed for my cattle. But none of that is going to be sold. I've got my my congressionally approved wheat and then my which I'll, I'll try and ship out of state and then the rest of my wheat, which I'm going to uh, keep for me and my family. And Congress said, nope, that violates the law. And he went all the way to the Supreme Court arguing this wheat was never going to be sold. There was no commerce that was going to be happening. So how could Congress regulate it? And the Supreme Court came down and said, this is the dormant commerce clause. And they said the him using uh, his own wheat means he wouldn't buy someone else's wheat. And so therefore that was impacting interstate commerce. Therefore Congress could go ahead and regulate it. And because literally that decision 
uh, it created this dormant commerce clause. And then, you know, um, almost it was probably 80 years later that uh, Congress got it into its head that not buying health insurance impacts the interstate commerce of health insurance. So therefore, we can actually regulate health insurance in a way that forces people to participate in the market. And that that started in 19, I think it was 1929 when the case was either brought or decided, uh, Wickard versus 32. It doesn't matter. It was during the Depression era. Uh, the markets were all a mess. And mm -hmm. uh, that's that case and the legacy of that decision has carried with it today. So the the downside of this amendment is that Congress is already doing that. Um, the problem, of course, you, yours is slightly different because they have to uh, comport within the Bill of Rights and explain how they would have the right to regulate your property, right? <laughs> Which would yeah. seem to directly violate <laughs> the Fifth Amendment. But, no, you know, what the am Fifth I? Amendment doesn't matter. What are you talking about? <laughs> you know, it's funny how much people don't like the Fifth Amendment when... Um, when it doesn't, uh, when it protects the person they don't like. And mm -hmm. I'll be, I'll, Mr. Laundry. Uh, uh, well, <laughs> Mr. Laundry is one of them, but, um, let me, let, so the other day I was talking about Martin Shkreli. And so I did a, I was doing a little research and he had a congressional hearing and there was, uh, there was a congressman I really like. He's really good or was a congressman and he was really good at, uh, asking people questions in Congress. And that was Trey Gowdy. Hmm. Oh man. Trey Gowdy and Jason Chaffetz were so mad at Martin Shkreli for having the audacity to plead the fifth that they were making, cons they used their entire speaking time to make legal arguments about why he shouldn't be able to plead the fifth. And he would just look at them, his lawyer would come up and whisper in his ear and say, uh, and he would say, on advice of counsel, I will take my fifth amendment right to not speak and not answer this question. And it was pissing them off so much. And it's like, wait a minute, no. This, you guys are supposed to be the good guys on the Constitution, but they were so <laughs> pissed at Martin Shkreli. And uh, so that's, you know, the one aspect of the Fifth Amendment is your right not to self-incriminate. But the other aspect, of course, is your right to not be deprived of property without due process. And the interesting thing about that is how we understand what a property right is. Um, and and th it should actually read not to be deprived of your property rights without due process because you don't actually own any property in any real way. You have mm -hmm. a property right that is superior to someone else and potentially inferior to someone else. That's how property works. Who has the best right to it? And so infringing upon a property right would suggest that your right to choose how you dispose of or use that property, for example, growing wheat, cannot be infringed because if the whole purpose of buying a plot of land is for you to grow wheat and then Congress says, nope, you can't grow wheat. Well, then you're not actually deriving uh, the full benefit of your property right. And it's been infringed. That's in my opinion, what the fifth amendment means. And it's, it should be amended to say that as such, I think we should do little tweaky amendments here and there personally, but, um, except but repeal yeah, so, the 17th, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but so uh, anyway, the the way this works out, they they kind of do this, although it's it's just blown up by the Supreme Court's interpretation of the Commerce Clause, and and they've got such broad power. We know now that the Taxing and Spending Clause is is so much more powerful even than the Commerce Clause was, and that's the the unsung tragedy of the healthcare decision is that. Um, we found out that, oh, you can't do this under the, the Commerce Clause. That's ridiculous. You can definitely do this under the tax and spending power of Congress. It's like, wait, <laughs> <laughs> it's unconstitutional under this one, but you're that, fine with it under the other one. Got isn't it. that where they misconstrue the word appropriate to be appropriate? <laughs> <laughs> Possibly. Possibly. Because you yeah. see that a lot in, in the Constitution. Congress... Uh, May up or up, up may, by appropriate, may, may by appropriate legislation, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, that's right. Yeah, it's appropriate legislation, not appropriate legislation. <laughs> Doesn't mean Congress could just go out there and steal your life's blood. Yes. Um, <laughs> although they're they're fucking trying. Um, <laughs> and uh, next ad, real quick, next ad. Wrong fucking button. I'll get used to this. Um Son of a bitch. Okay. You will never. 
Tonight's episode is brought to you by the Ridgedale Brand Care Package. Do you have a bunch of people lined up under a bridge at the southern border? Well, take care of that humanitarian crisis in a flash with the Ridgedale Brand Care Package. This uh, design is available on all of our products at the Redbubble store. Once again, the link is in the description, and Nightbot is uh, putting that out there. So, Nightbot's on the case. It is. And I do all of our designs, every single one of them. They take me an inordinate suck. amount of time. Um, the next one we have is uh, the Legislative and Regulatory Review Amendment. I told you we had an amendment for that. Members of Congress yeah. must spend a minimum of 210 days total working in the seat of the Capitol. Now, this is something that I didn't realize was wrong until I was recording the audiobook. Um, it should say 210 days per year total uh, working yes. in the seat of the Capitol. 30 of which to be spent reviewing and repealing any and all legislation repugnant to the U.S. Constitution. So um, we have been told that uh, it's very difficult to repeal a law. We say bullshit. (laughs) And so we want to make a rule that requires they repeal laws. Um, I'm guessing you're probably okay with it, um, but I'm guessing we may have missed a couple of things here. So what are your thoughts on this uh, this particular um, proposal for an amendment? Well, the... Um, oh, boy. This is a <laughs> tough one. Because it, it, uh, at first, it sounds very appealing. Mm-hmm. But the question is, um, do we actually want... Do we actually want our, uh, let's say, your Iowa state house or your Iowa national house representative spending 210 days in Washington, DC. Do we actually want that? Because there's, there's this idea out there that, um, the, the ivory tower of Washington, DC, uh, influences, perverts, and changes the people who are elected to office in that they lose touch with the populace that they are, uh, you know, designed to serve. And so this is, this is one of the hard parts of those amendments because if you're and thinking back to 1790, right? Um, if your if your guy was gone for 210 days, you were never going to see them, right? As That's an, an Iowanian, you were never going to. <laughs> and even now, though, uh, you know, it it would be very very difficult to get uh, the sort of any sort of FaceTime with a congressman. Now, in a lot of districts, that doesn't matter. Right in California, you've got one congressman per, you know, I think it's like 700,000 people or something. You're not getting FaceTime unless you're connected. But right. out out in my area, uh, you know, our, our representative represents something like, um, it, I mean, it's it's not super low, but it's it's like 150,000 people. And mm-hmm. so when you when you compare those two things like the amount of disparity between uh, a California representative and a Minnesota representative, you have more of a chance here at doing that. And especially the closer you are to the county seat. But that being said, or the the county seat where they keep their office, that being said, the, the ultimate question remains, do we want our congressmen spending more time with the people in their district or do we want them spending more time with the other perverts in Washington? I mean, the other Congress people in Washington, because it is a uh, it is a question of are they still representing you or are they representing the interests that are localized in the Capitol? And um, one of the big problems that contributes to this, of course, is the popular election of senators, mm-hmm. um, which is something that was not really designed into our country senators were supposed to be elected by the state uh the state houses they Mm -hmm. would be uh, elected and just chosen and appointed is maybe a better term they would be appointed to their legislative or their their senate positions and then they would be representing the state interests if you had something like that then you've got house members that are uh you could actually choose at that point who is who is going and and do you want both the House and Senate there for 210 days or do you want just the Senate there for 210 days because they're a little bit more immune and they're not representing the people anyway. So they're representing state interest and, and that's something different. Um, 
I, I think there's some distinctions that can be drawn there. And the question of whether we keep popular election of senators will have a lot to do with how this turns out, uh, mm -hmm. in my opinion. That's, that's one of the things. The other uh, 30 of which will be spent reviewing and repealing. Um, I, maybe, maybe just a minor modification, uh, repealing if necessary. I, I do think the idea that there should be um, a set amount of time dedicated to the review of laws which would, you know, presumably if Congress is going to spend 30 days uh, out of each year reviewing laws that are on the books and they're mandated to do that during a 30 day period, they would dock it up some laws for review and do it. But I don't think you can force them to repeal laws because at some theoretical point uh, there would be no law to repeal in an ideal world. Right. Like that would be mm -hmm. the I now, obviously we're talking 50,000 years in the future <laughs> because we've got so many laws on the books that it's impossible to uh, consider that. But that's, mm -hmm. yeah, that's it's not like point. it would all get handled in one term. Right. right. <laughs> what? And no, this, you have 30 days. We just figured it out. Oh, did you? <laughs> How'd you get through the tax code? One of them, one of them <laughs> right. is just going to sit there and say, you know what? The Constitution's our system restore button. Press that button. Yeah, but the uh, the main the main criticism I have of it is this this concept of do we actually want to take our representatives and mandate they be in an ivory tower for a specific amount of time? I almost feel like uh, it would be. No, I, I I don't know if we should mandate that they not be in Washington or that mm -hmm. they spend a, a given amount of office time um, in their own districts. That's Maybe really that would be. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, but but that's a tough one, I, I, and and one of the things I want to get across is for me, term limits on Congress actually solve quite a few of these issues, in general, um, because if, actually, if you have it, oh go ahead, oh go ahead, <clears throat> um, we uh, and, and we mentioned this in the book, um, we we believe that uh, that term limits, while while not a bad idea. Um, it can limit your uh, your good like like your Rand Pauls um, who are going to be in there and being a wrench in the machine for as long as possible, um, which is why we wrote in the um, uh, the balanced budget amendment that if they don't pass a balanced budget, then the entire Congress becomes ineligible to have any position uh, whose salary is paid by the taxpayers um, at the at the end of their term, um, and that's that's the short version um, because it's instead of putting a, a limitation on the right of the people to choose their representatives, um, it forces them to do the damn job they were hired to do. <laughs> <laughs> and we actually, we did some digging on uh, on a lot of this stuff. Like the, the 230 days uh, or 210 days was based on um, the the averages of the existing terms, um, which, I mean, you're 100% sure. right that, that it does put them in an ivory tower. Um, oh, yeah. But uh, as far as I'm, it, like I'm surprised a, we didn't think of that. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, we were we were no. doing other things. Um, well, disappointed. Well, I mean. <laughs> well, this is why you always like this is this is why you do what you're doing, right? Mm -hmm. Like this exactly. is why you ask for the the input is. Uh, yeah. Oh yeah, we didn't we didn't think of this one aspect of that, and so you modify. Right, and, and exactly. we even if wrote necessary. that into the book. I mean, we going over this book. I mean, it, we spent probably six months of early mornings, late nights, and weekends writing this book, and it's just two guys. I mean, imagine the uh, the statistical improbability of the original Constitution being written by like thirty people uh, writing angry letters at each other in newspapers, <laughs> <laughs> sent on horseback, mind you. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh yeah. But uh, when when we did the balanced budget amendment, it was based off of something I'd seen on Facebook um, years ago, and I looked it up, and there's been one balanced budget amendment proposed in this millennium. And it actually specified that the balance or that um, there is an exception to the balanced budget requirement in that amendment in cases of uh, America being at war. It was written in 2012 when America had been at war for 11 years. All they have to do is uh, constantly be at war, the war on drugs, the war on terror, mm -hmm. the war in Iraq, the war on homelessness. Yeah, and that that's, and that's a, the thing. The word war is fungible. Right. And so my thinking was with the balanced budget amendment, um, they can go into debt to do things like go to war. 
but then they they have to know that uh, they're ending their career. So is America's interest in entering a foreign conflict higher than their interest in their career in Washington? Um, so it was it's kind of a, a mutually assured destruction type of uh, type of situation. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, but it, it's just it is amazing to me um, doing all this research, how completely obvious it is that everybody in both of the major parties just hates every one of us. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> um, they, they don't give a lick. Uh, Mitch, go ahead and take the next one and then we'll do the uh, the last ad closer to the end of the show. Right on. This is a, whoa, there it is. This is a voting rights amendment. Ooh. Because let's have some fun. And it reads, all citizens of the United States of America who shall have attained the age of 18 years shall not be denied the right to vote, accepting and exclusively during incarceration and parole for the conviction of a felony, after which the right to vote shall be restored except in the case of those duly convicted of treason, in which case the right to vote shall be permanently denied. Yeah, I mean, I I have, uh, I actually don't have any problem with this amendment uh, that I can see. Because I, I, look, when you- You get Arthur all excited. I don't care if you're, if you're, if you're a felon and you are, uh, sentenced to a commitment and then you serve that commitment and you are sentenced to parole uh, and and you serve that parole, I do not see why you should still be denied a right to vote afterwards. I know it may be undesirable for certain people to vote, but you know, uh, in someone else's opinion, it's undesirable for any of us to vote. So to me, Joe uh, Biden. you know, the, well, you know, not as I'm thinking through this, I might have a minor, a minor problem. But it's oh, we're talking about an edge case. But we'll we'll get to that in a minute. If we're going to keep voting, um, as as recognizing a, a vote as a right, how's how's that for my qualifier? If we're Indeed. going to recognize voting as a right, then I don't disagree with this because if you've served your time then that is the sentence that the the system of justice has determined you are ordered to serve, and then that's done. I don't see why after that you should not be allowed to vote again or why you should have to petition someone for this right to vote. In a similar vein, I would say that, uh, well, you know, the same thing would apply to firearms, for example. Yes. Um, and because uh, and, I, I just think it's it's silly that your rights can be infringed after your service is complete. Um, but the the one question I would have is, is there a right to vote that should exist? Because there isn't technically a right to vote in the U.S. Constitution. Mm -hmm. um, the, the When a state decides to issue a right to vote, then we protect that right, or we're supposed to protect that right equally, except in cases of basically felons, uh, who, who lose that right. Um, the, uh, but, uh, but I, I do think citizenship should be tied to voting. So I really do appreciate that language. Um, that's, wasn't that's one of the things <laughs> I didn't, I didn't assume much was, uh, so that's, that's that's one of the things I think we need to talk about in general with this country is is that citizenship should confer benefit above non citizenship. Um, Absolutely, and uh, it does not really do that anymore in any tangible way nowadays. Mm -hmm. uh, that being a citizen is it's just another mark on the document, and the only the only right that it kind of impacts is voting rights. Everything else seems to be different, but. Or seems to be the same whether you're a citizen or not. Uh, but the the no, I, I think if we're going to preserve voting as a right and voting in the way that we do it as a system, then um, then I like this amendment. But I am I'm not I'm not a hundred percent on the democratically elected stuff for everything. Uh, it, it, not that I know the alternative, right? But um, 
But I, I do think there's a system by which a state could come up with its own scheme that does not involve voting, direct voting in a direct democracy uh, that that would maybe be better. I don't know what it is, but I'm willing to entertain the possibility that some uh, entrepreneurial Congress people could come up with something <laughs> well, that would for, that'd be either really fun or really disastrous. For example, um, applying the Electoral College idea to the states. Right. Yeah. yeah Razorfist's so the, video on that is incredible and yeah, too damn smart for his own good. <laughs> yeah, he's a, he's a sharp guy, and uh, yeah, I mean, if you if you had some sort of electoral college system, or if there was, uh, you know, maybe maybe a state decides that only its tax paying base uh, has a has a voting right. I mean, maybe that because that's that's in a way how the Constitution was originally written. It was, of course, white landowning males, but the reason it was white landowning males primarily is because that covered. 98 percent roughly of taxpayers and so uh and th there was a little bit of there might have been a little bit of racial animus in there uh, i'm not going to discount that possibility but the idea is that you know these are the people with skin in the game they own they own the land uh they're not transient they're not mobile uh we didn't we didn't have a rental sort of community the way you do now, right? Where everybody is leasing property or mm -hmm. leasing a space on property. I mean, you did have that. You had indentured servitude. You had uh, live-in uh, people. There, there was actually, um, you know, there was a, a community of that, but it, but it was not a class of people that the founders believed would have a right to vote because they could, in theory, at any time, pack up and move somewhere else with no investment in, or longevity to their to their influence. And so, uh, the it's it's always funny when you do like a reductio ad absurdum sort of argument on all this stuff, and you try and envision what 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 could you do if you could convince four million people right? Like a group of 4 million people to transiently move through the states, exercise voting rights uh, on the state legislature, and then move to the next state, right? Like if, if you shift 4 million people in a group into Texas, could you turn it blue? I think you could if they had a oh, concerted yeah. effort. You could turn they, are, blue. they do have a concerted effort. They're doing it or they're trying to do it now. I mean, it's, I don't think it's, it's going to work. It's called Green California. <laughs> right. But they're, they're doing it in a more haphazard fashion. But I'm saying, like, what if you could actually organize this? Like, yeah. imagine the damage you could wreak in uh, Louisiana or Wyoming or Colorado or, you know, anywhere. Colorado's you bring a already ruined. It's why I don't live there anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So the the idea, though, is that 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 transient nature of that population would be damaging to the state's integrity for those who plan to live there forever or, mm -hmm. or for an extended period of time. So when you when you start thinking about it that way, um, you know, they're they're just I just have questions on if this system is the, the this demo, democratic system is the proper one. Um, and I'm, I'm not so sure it is. So uh, I think. I, I agree with the amendment insofar as if we're going to enshrine a right to vote, then this would be the appropriate thing. Because if you want everybody to vote, it's got to be everybody gets the vote uh, unless they lose it. And that loss should be temporary and extremely limited to uh, to the very specific nature of the act that caused it to be lost. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Coming right down to it, um, the reason we came up with this one was we keep hearing all this talk about paying your debt to society. Well, if, if, the, if the debt is paid, stop collecting. Yep. Right. Return exactly. the right to vote. Return the right to firearms. I'm surprised we didn't think about return the right to firearms because we're such enthusiasts in that regard. Enthusiast. That's funny. <laughs> Sometimes as an enthusiast, you, you overlook what should be obvious, right? Yes. Like mm -hmm. the right to a firearm shall not be infringed. It's it's pretty interesting because if you really think about what's written there, Congress shall make no law. Uh, wait, no, no, no. That's that's, that's the, first the First one. Amendment. The second one says the right to keep and bear... Uh, well, uh, a well-regulated militia yeah. being necessary, necessary to the security to of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. 
we, right. we, so we then, talked a lot about the uh, Second Amendment. <laughs> the the argument the argument then is that well the people's right isn't being infringed it's just the person's right it's that that semantic argument when when we say well one person's right to firearms is gone because they're a felon the people's right wasn't infringed the people generally reserve that right but this person has forfeit it and so that's the kind of justification that they get for it but if but if you think about it it's like that is still an infringement of the right yes, like that it is. It, it's just one that that is tolerated for whatever reason. If you if you think about how the the amendment is written and what it says, it would say shall not be infringed ever, even in the case of a felon. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, the question is is do we do we do it that way? I believe the penalty for felonies at the time of passage was death. Uh, <laughs> there there were not many felonies. Um, misdemeanors right. were misdemeanors and and gross misdemeanors were the the typical laws that you would see felonies would be really serious thefts uh infringements on property rights were very important of course and then you know murders and uh severe assaults and so the penalties included death for felons uh, yep. at the time that this this was passed and so that they really didn't need to worry about so much taking their guns <laughs> well, and largely <laughs> back then largely back then um you didn't have you know a 150 year appeal process for the death penalty either the judge would say i sentence you to hang from the neck until dead you have 40 48 hours to make yourself right with whatever god you believe in <laughs> yep and, yeah. well, and then you, they were hanged <laughs> yes and you look yeah. at it from the other angle too uh, to dispel that people slash person dichotomy, um, if a, if an individual can be denied their their constitutional rights, do you live in a free state? Right. No. Yeah, that's a good question. And and free state clause right there in the Second Amendment, the security of a free state. Mm hmm. Yep. Uh, real quick, and we I love a... that. I love the free state argument. It makes me makes me giggly in the shorts. Uh, we, we have a chat from uh, Mr. Scott says, uh, make blimpies great again. And then old, <laughs> old coom sock. Thanks for that. Uh, says, oh, Nick's favorite God, <laughs> I know. Gross. Uh, Nick's favorite sandwiches are from blimpies. So disgusting. Uh, <laughs> what is wrong with you people? You know what? Ew. They paid to say it. So, <laughs> you know, we were as a joke, Nick, going to write a constitutional amendment. That would require Subway to return to their original sandwich cut. Yes. <laughs> because no, I'm a hundred percent behind this. No, I'm with you on that. Cut that motherfucker like a canoe. Mm -hmm. Yes. None of the shit ever fell out. And you could eat your fucking sandwich. You get bread, meat, and shit all in one fucking bite. You didn't have to you, you didn't have to play fucking where's Waldo with your sandwich. <laughs> oh, and let me just say, you know, the the other the other big advantage of the U gouge is it helped it helped the dummies working at Subway, who I guess have never made a sandwich in their entire life, understand that you take the mayonnaise that you're gonna put on the sandwich and you spread it on the bread. Because yep. nobody goes home, makes a sandwich, and then squirts mayonnaise all over the lettuce like some sort of weirdo. Nobody makes a sandwich that way except Subway, where they're like, oh, yeah, you just squirt the mayo over top of all the toppings. Like, no, you put it on the bread. It's a layer to prevent uh, juices and other stuff from seeping into your bread and making it soggy. That's why the mayonnaise exists. That's why it's there. <laughs> You don't squirt it on top. That's gross and degenerate. And so they they would cut it out. They get that spatula. They just go, and they were done. It took it took no time, and it was right, and it was good. All was good in the world. See, this goes back to my that's issue. That's why with you cops. come here. If you like rants, if you like black pills, if you like shit, you better fucking like the stream and share it. God damn it! <laughs> <laughs> I so caught that one. That, I caught that one live, and I'm like, I'm clipping that. I'm putting that in my soundboard. I got the soundboard app to put that in my soundboard. <laughs> that, guy, that guy sounds charming. Absolutely. <laughs> Goes back to my argument about fucking cops. Raise the lower, or I'm sorry, raise the hiring standards to where they once were. Yeah. Yeah. My God, I don't know. If, I, I, I wonder if you've run into this case, Nick. Um. It was in the uh, 
think it was in a district court, but it was a federal judge named Peter C. Dorsey in 1999 made a ruling against an applicant in, and the ruling was in favor of the new London, Connecticut police department because okay. he sued, he sued the police department because they hired him for scoring too high on an IQ test. They, they wow. fired him. No, they did. I think they didn't even interview him because he scored too high and he sued as a result and the judge ruled against him. <laughs> I understand the right of free association and all that, but do we really? No, want a we legal want dumber press, cops right we really away. Want a legal precedent that says it's okay to hire the dumbest asshole possible. Yes. Yeah, that, yes, that sounds do. great. Uh, real quick, head over to ridgedalebrand.locals.com for exclusive content. And uh, if you want to get the notifications for the streams going live, because I know every one of you has subscribed to this channel. Um, but uh, you're not going to get those notifications on any platform except for locals. So head over to ridgedalebrand.locals.com. It's free. There's ex exclusive stuff over there every week, um, even for the free users. Once again, that's ridgedalebrand.locals.com. Wrong button. While we're on the subject of whiskey, Nick, when are you releasing a whiskey? <laughs> uh, man, if I knew how to do stuff like that, uh, I would have already done it. Because <laughs> I've already got a gimmick for you. Uh-oh. It's Nick Wakita's Frisky Whiskey, now available Ooh. wherever value meals are sold. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> you no, the, in... the hard part about releasing a whiskey is is releasing one that isn't garbage right mm -hmm. like because i ever look, value meals are sold right yeah <laughs> i i bought a bottle of proper 12 and i'm like conor mcgregor has 100 million more dollars than i'll ever have in my entire life and his whiskey sucks <laughs> so like uh, how am I supposed to do this? Like, how am I supposed to really, I need a Polish whiskey. There we go. Uh, <laughs> you should look into, Polak um, attack. you should look into the, uh, the whiskey tribe. Um, I'm not sure if you, I know you have so much time to watch YouTube channels. Um, but they have, uh, they have two channels. One is the whiskey vault and all they do is every day they do a whiskey review. He has, is it, that, is it the guy with the, he's bald. He's got the goatee. Yes. Yep. I've seen them. I like those. They do the whiskey sommelier course yes, too. Yes, they do. Yep. Uh, if I had I've five grand, I would do that. And hard. <laughs> I've thought long and hard about doing it for the you know as for the show, of course, mm -hmm. uh, going and and becoming a whiskey sommelier. But it you it requires like six weekends in a row that you have to fly down to Arizona or something. Uh, where Austin, they are. Texas. I, oh, by, oh, oh, they're in Austin. Austin. Okay. Yeah. Well, you, oh God. You have to go to Austin six times in a row. Ugh. Well, I think the, the first level is is four days, um, and that but it's six grand. So I mean, it's it's not cheap. Um, so I right. can't afford to do it. But I would. It gives you access to their vault, and they have like four hundred different types of whiskey in their vault, um, including some very very rare whiskeys. <laughs> so but case, uh, but they have do? their own distillery too, and so uh, maybe if you were to partner with them. Um, you could uh, help work on a blend. I think their first bourbon oh. is coming out. <laughs> what you do I'm is sure you, they're you, they're anxious you, to work with <laughs> with, with the like, YouTuber because that's what worked did out you, so well for other companies. What did you say about fat women on <laughs> what what date was that one? I need to go back and review my notes uh. <laughs> or find a whiskey you like and just write up a branding deal. Uh, trying to do that. So, uh, lore, Ricada Law lore, early on, a bunch of people, without my prompting, started to tag Lagavulin hmm. on uh. Facebook. And they said, you need to you need to sponsor this show because I was drinking a ton of Lagavulin back then. Uh, and I, I still would. I still like it. But um, they eventually contacted me um, on Facebook and sent me a message. And they said, uh, we understand you're a big fan of our whiskey, and we really appreciate that. And I mean, I, I I had people who were in Scotland sending me stuff saying, yeah, the distillery, like the people who work there know who you are. Huh. I, think. I was like, oh, that's awkward. But um, <laughs> they said, uh, we cannot advertise on your channel because it violates our advertiser guidelines. And the advertiser guideline that it violated is uh, they're, they're owned by Diego. 
uh, and Diego owns something like 60% of whiskey distribution on the, on the earth. Mm -hmm. And, um, they they own Johnny Walker, they own Jim Beam, they own just a ton of different uh, whiskey brands of all stripes. And their advertiser guidelines say that no one advertising their whiskey can be seen to enjoy it. <laughs> huh. That's like that's like never joining a club that would have you as a member. Yeah, it's uh, so if you notice, like Nick Offerman does the uh, does the Lagavulin partnerships, mm -hmm. um, has his own brand, everything. Nick Offerman never smiles in any of those things. It's always contemplative. It's always that stern, you know, it's his care. It's the, the, uh, the, the Ron, uh, whatever his name is. Ron character. Swanson. Jeremy. Ron Swanson. Ron Swanson. Yeah. Ron Jeremy. Uh, no. Ron Jeremy. He's got his own legal <laughs> troubles right now. Like, like 21 counts of RAPE. So, uh, he's got some stuff, but no, so he's never smiling. He's always stern and matter of fact about it. And it's, it's a manly and, and refined thing. You can't mm. have people smiling and laughing because if they're smiling and laughing, that looks fun. And if a kid sees you smiling and laughing and drinking whiskey, they'll drink whiskey too. And mm. you know what? Lagavulin really does not want people to start drinking whiskey. That would be a terrible thing for them. Wow. So <laughs> <laughs> it's a, I, w I was blown away. I'm like, what do you mean? I'm what violates your guidelines? And I'm reading through it and it's like, Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, I laugh and smile and you can't do that while consuming it. So, so they did, they did reach out and they said, uh, you know, we're glad that you like it, but you know, we can't do it. And so then I made fun of them. Now they probably never will, uh, but well, that's yeah. okay. It's well, like, I'm you could have uh... just told me I would have done, I would have done sponsored ads without laughing. Like I can do that. <laughs> yeah. I've, uh, I've been drinking a lot of, um, Buffalo trace recently because, um, what you call an expensive whiskey and what I call an expensive whiskey. Well, what I call an expensive whiskey, you call a uh, trash cheap whiskey. <laughs> um, my, my, my fancy expensive is, uh, is $43 a bottle and it's uh it's Davidson reserve. Um, and, uh, that's a, mm. it's a little distillery out of Nashville. Um, they distribute in four States like Missouri, Kentucky, Tennessee, and Alabama, I think. So, uh, but okay. it's, it's really, really good, uh, for a $45 bottle of whiskey. Um, and then my, uh, that my favorite rye is actually the high West double rye, which I cannot find anywhere anymore. Um, that one's really high West good. is nice a good rye. Yep. Yeah. Um, nice and spicy. Um, I've had monkey shoulder because the, the whiskey tribe guys suggested it. I got hung over before I finished an ounce of it. It didn't matter <laughs> how much water I drink. It is like the dirtiest, grossest scotch i've ever had <laughs> I'm, I'm not a i'm just not a huge fan of monkey shoulder i had a, it was like this is okay i guess eh. but uh it, it was not not winter have you had rittenhouse rye i have not i've not been able to find it um it, when you uh, if you can it's it's very inexpensive i mean it's like 27 bucks i mean we're not talking okay. a bank breaker and it is a very solid rye. I didn't know it's it's a distillery that's been around for a really long time, mm -hmm. and it's it's one of those like old granddad and stuff like that where it's it's kind of one of these staple rye whiskeys from a long time ago. But it's a and and that's one of the reasons it's so inexpensive is because they have the you know they have the uh, distribution setup mm -hmm. and and the infrastructure to make their. I guess entry level whiskey very consistently, and the Rittenhouse Rye is very very good, especially mm. especially for under thirty bucks a bottle. Yeah, now, if Kyle could just get them to sponsor his legal <laughs> defense. Um, yeah, and then actually, my, people uh, like a good double entendre. My uh, <laughs> my local liquor store does have a bottle of the Peg Leg Porker sixteen year, but I don't have six hundred dollars to spend on a bottle. They of whiskey. have a sixteen year. Mm hmm. You can actually get it in their tasting room, which is uh, up in the top floor of the uh, of the restaurant. Um, so, yeah, I've only have, ever seen the twelve. They have and eight, the eight. Tw they have eight, twelve, and sixteen. Um, but yeah, the sixteen is like five or six hundred dollars. It's it's not cheap. Nick's <laughs> contemplating a road trip. Look, check out that look on his face, man. I want one badly. <laughs> uh, I'm trying. I'm like, when am I going to be around Tennessee next? Huh? Well, have you no have idea. You have my phone number. I'll text you my address. <laughs> yeah, I'll Venmo you six hundred dollars. Uh, um, real quick, Amazon.com. See even if you can order it. 
Uh, it is. Uh, it is. It is that time. Uh, degeneracy has entered. Ask the question. Balls or no balls? And no. He says Nick oh. can explain why balls are better. Um, okay. Mm-hmm. I wasn't going to say it, but we have the time, I suppose. the The balls or no balls question is. Um, it is not a matter of what is correct because we obviously know that, like in reality, um, intersex is not going to have the balls. This is about animation. So the question is, how does it work from a a limited real estate perspective? Because there's only so much space down there. So where do the balls exist? Are they like inside the the lips? Is there more? Uh, no, they more hang space? down. Yeah, but how? I mean, you it's got not... an inch and a half. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Sometimes I'm saying the obvious answer is is balls. There, there is no other correct answer um, because it is both fully functioning organs in the, uh, and it can't be fully functioning without balls. Right. It's. I it's have my own be. answer. Okay, go ahead. I have my own answer, which cleverly lets me avoid answering the question. Um, when it comes to balls or no balls, I think Nick should market a T-shirt with an American flag on it that says balls or no balls, because now it's a double entendre. And he's asking, does America have balls or not? But for the people in the know, it's an even funnier joke. <laughs> there you go. I like Sell it. Sell them t-shirts, Nick. Get on that. But grip. no, what you need, what you need is an anime chick holding an American flag. Even better. And that says balls or no balls right there. And see, then the people in the go. know are like, what is this all about? See, and, Master Grifter. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> horrible. Um, and uh, I think that uh, that is a good time for uh, Nick. Do you have any last uh, parting thoughts before we give Mitch the last word? Um, I mean, the one thing, I, I think what you guys are doing is really important because we have gotten this idea that amending the constitution and 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 changing like the status quo is somehow bad but we have surrendered the amending of the constitution and changing the status quo to the supreme court we just let nine people do it instead of letting the nation do it under the process that was created this is ultimately why i don't like judicial review in the first place is because it allows nine sitting justices to redefine what the Constitution says and what the Constitution means. Literally both of them. It just goes ahead and, and says, nope. Uh, and, and the only way to change that would be for Congress to pass an amendment that says, no, we really meant it this way, which they won't do because uh, they, you know, it was hard enough to get legislation passed. So the, the idea of judicial review perverting the legislative process is the problem. And so I like what you guys are doing. And I also want to encourage people that really it is not as rare to amend the constitution as we think. And so uh, some people say that there's no way you're going to ever get a constitutional amendment passed. The last one was passed in 1992. Uh, That was, you know, we're coming up on 30 years from, from then, but the one before that was passed about 30 years prior And we actually have a pretty decent record of amending the Constitution every 30 years. And when you when you think about what's going on in the country right now and and the the amount of political divide, the reason that amendments are passed is because of political divide. It's settling a question. Um, And so there there is actually some hope that we could see some major reforms and having the right people talking about it and being open to changing the constitution and being open to uh, even if it's changing it back for for to its original state or what we think the original intent was clarifying those things we got to have people talking about it because otherwise the people who are talking about it um in a different way will be the ones who are prepared for the discussion that we're not prepared for so i really like what you guys are doing well, we appreciate that. Um, so, Mitch, go ahead and take that last word. Oh, yeah. Our lovely inspirational quote for the evening. A fist raised in solidarity without lube will cause chafing. 
Till next time, thanks for watching. And until then, shake it naked. <laughs>